Hello, and welcome from wherever in the world you're tuning in. This group of talks and this session center around the interplay between anesthesia and how it might be able to discover some of the principles behind neural networks and consciousness. I'm specifically going to be talking about consciousness and the brain as a nonlinear system. And the work I'm going to be presenting today is work I did at Stanford with the colleagues listed in this paper. Dr. Bruce McIver is also speaking in the session as well as moderating it. Now, since this conference brings together many kinds of people who are interested in the study of consciousness from pharmaceutical, behavioral, and philosophical perspectives uh, to physics, neuroscience, and quantum biology, I thought it might be valuable to talk about why we study consciousness from the perspective of anesthesia. Consciousness has never been an easy thing to define, and often it's stumped scientists and philosophers who have been trying to generate definitions and hypotheses. Basic questions like whether you and you and I might perceive 670 nanometers wavelength of light as the same red have plagued the field for a very long time. Uh, this problem that was recognized by early philosophers and scientists are sort of captured in this quote by Sir Isaac Newton to his friend, Sir Henry Oldenburg, to determine by what modes our actions like produceth in our minds the phantasm of color is not so easy. There is in fact another way to approach the problem. One can look at what naturally occurring or drug-induced states of depressed consciousness have in common. So that could be natural sleep, it could be drug-induced anesthesia, um, or even coma. In fact, without the problematic issue of having to have a precise definition, people generally agree that these states reflect diminished consciousness. Now, it's key here is that the lever that, that is being perturbed is not the contents of consciousness, but it's actually the level of consciousness. Now, anesthesia is an especially interesting case. Without anesthetic drugs, modern surgery wouldn't be possible. We give drugs that make humans blissfully unaware of the surgeon's knife. And these drugs specifically target the central nervous system. They bind to receptors reversibly and dissolve conscious awareness. And when procedures are over, we wash the anesthetic out of the brain and people recover conscious awareness. And we can do this reversibly without damaging brains. So this gives us a number of interesting opportunities by using this particular, these particular drugs as our source of perturbation. And I would say that understanding this process has even made its way into the popular media and it's drawing attention from the lay public. So to really describe what we do and specifically what we did in the study, I'm going to take you into the operating room with me. So this is an example of what I will do when I take a patient into the OR. I'll actually put a set of frontal leads, electrodes, on top of their forehead as soon as they get settled on the OR table. And what you can see behind me on my left shoulder are real-time brainwaves. That is the raw electroencephalograph that is coming from each of the leads that I have placed on this patient. And by doing this before I even administer a single anesthetic drug, I can actually watch my patient's brains move from being awake and aware to losing conscious awareness. I can watch them during this entire process during which I'm maintaining anesthesia. And when I wash the anesthetic out of their brain, I can actually watch their brains, I guess, reassemble into conscious awareness. Every drug that I give is also marked in this EEG, every perturbation, the surgeon's knife. So this is essentially an incredibly well-labeled data set of EEG and all the interventions. Now here's an example of what I might see. <clears throat> Here are two EEG traces that are coming from two representative leads on this patient's forehead. This happens to be a commercial uh, monitor for this kind of monitoring. It's called a Sedline monitor by a company called Massimo. But to be honest, it doesn't really matter which company you use. Uh, the information that's actually important is that raw waveform and something, and basically the metrics that we can obtain from that. So before we proceed, and given that there's probably a varied audience um, tuning in, I'm actually gonna explain how we analyze an EEG waveform. So you see this uh, sort of a, a, a sample EEG, a cartoon of an EEG on that time axis. And it's a complex signal in time. It's a time series. 
And what you can do is you can break it down into a series of frequency bands or oscillations. Uh, the way we have defined these frequency bands is anything from zero to four hertz or between zero to four peaks per second, we call it a delta wave. Between four to eight hertz is a theta wave. Between eight to 12 hertz is an alpha wave. 12 to 25 is a beta wave. And greater than 25 hertz, that's a gamma oscillation. Now, what you see happening on the x, excuse me, on the y-axis is a calculation of the relative power of each of these frequency bands. So if there's a lot of power in the delta or the slow wave region, you'll actually see a much larger peak than you would, for instance, in the higher frequency bands. Now, you can actually convert this relative power into a heat map. Any oscillation that has a lot of power relative to others is labeled red and those that are almost not present are labeled in blue. So imagine this sort of like a topographic map. The top of the mountain peak is colored in red and sea level would be in blue. And by doing this, you can track, as you can see on the x-axis, frequency in time. And you can look at the relative contribution of each frequency. And this is actually a spectrogram that was created for human speech. But this gives us a visual way of tracking the EEG over time, or any sound wave for that matter. Now here's a real world example from patients taken from the operating room. So this is a patient that was first put on the table and they're completely awake and aware. And what you'll note is that there are two traces at the top. They say L and R, that's from the left and right side of the brain. And each of those vertical yellow lines represents a second. So you're seeing four seconds of real time EEG data. And you'll see that it's pretty jagged and sawtoothed. And if you look below it at the spectrogram that is being built, that edge, by the way, that leading edge is delayed in time by about four seconds because that fast Fourier transform, that analysis of frequencies is taking place in four second windows. And you'll see, um, and it's mirror reflected by the way, about the, about the x-axis. So both the left and right side of the brain are being plotted from zero to 30 Hertz. You'll see that when a person is awake, there is a fairly equal distribution of oscillations between zero to 30 hertz. That's between the delta to the gamma. There's an especially strong, say, contribution of delta and theta oscillations, but the rest of the oscillations are in green to red, which means that they have fairly equal power. Now, I hope all of you appreciate that there has been almost a step function change in that spectrogram. You can see that around minute 1237, um, all of a sudden there is a loss of high frequencies. They turn blue. And there is now an appearance of something coming up in about 10 hertz. This is after I pushed propofol and I was assessing every five seconds a loss of response to my voice. So imagine I push propofol and I would say, hey, Mr. So-and-so, are you still there? Can you open your eyes? And once they stopped responding, I would actually mark it in the EEG. And this is the surrogate that we used for loss of consciousness. Um, I hope you notice also that in the raw waveform that the waves have gotten considerably slower. Now, here's an example of what I call the Goldilocks zone of anesthesia. This is where a patient is really well anesthetized. They're not so deep that their brain is going into burst suppression and that they will take a long time to wake up, but they will not respond to external stimuli. And the thing that's really noticeable here is that there's a very dark red band in the delta ba uh, oscillation bandwidth, and there's also a very dark red band at the alpha frequency. And this sort of delta alpha is a sort of the hallmark of really good anesthesia. I'll just throw in there that um, younger patients have a much stronger alpha oscillation. So you would almost say that a young, healthy brain with more cognitive reserve actually looks a little bit more like this. And as we age, that alpha oscillation becomes fainter and fainter. Now, as I turn off the anesthetic, what ends up happening is as it gets washed out, you can see that the alpha oscillation on both sides of the brain is beginning to speed up in frequency. It almost looks like alligator jaws opening up. And by the time you get to this place just prior to wake up, just prior to emergence, um, many of those frequencies from zero to 20 hertz are becoming equalized in power once again.
finally, when you get to this place, uh, you can see it almost looks like another step function. This patient has regained consciousness. The raw way from the top looks jagged and sawtooth once again. And you can see a recovery in the spectrogram of colors in all of these high frequency ranges. Now, um, this is an example of using that same process to track consciousness over a three hour anesthetic. What's also interesting is you can see that this case was started at about 7.15 in the morning. And when the array is on a patient's forehead who's awake, what happens is there's a lot of contribution of high frequency noise. Some of that is from head movement, but a lot of the artifact is from muscle. It's from things like eye blinks, from facial expressions. And when the patient begins to calm down, uh, the amplifier is no longer saturated. So that blue dropout is gone. And now you begin to see some frequencies being picked up. And right at that edge over there, you can see that there's a fairly even distribution of colors in all of the frequency bands that we're plotting on the spectrogram. At the time that propofol is given, there's a pretty quick loss of consciousness that is assessed by loss of responsiveness. And then you see that pick up in the alpha band. And that becomes a very prominent oscillation along with the delta oscillation throughout the case. At the very end, you'll see two uh, white vertical lines. The infusion of both propofol and the pain drug that I was giving, which is lidocaine, were stopped. And a few minutes later, the patient recovered consciousness. And you can see that recovery in all of those high frequencies. Now, just to throw a wrench into the situation, it turns out that every patient's brain is a little bit different. The proportion um, or the relative proportion of oscillations in the alpha and the delta bands are a little bit different for each of them. Some of them have to do with age, as I mentioned to you, but some may have to do with our anesthetic drug choices. Are we using mostly GABAergic drugs? Have we thrown in a drug like nitrous or uh, an opiate um, or ketamine? Uh, another thing that may be affecting it is um, things like your genetics, and we haven't really truly explored those contributions. But suffice to say, it happens during both maintenance and even at emergence. So what does that tell us? It turns out that spectral analysis may have its limitations. Um, as you will see in this talk and even in Dr. McIver's talk, uh, spectral analyses may not be brain state invariant or drug invariant. So in some cases, they may not be significant discriminators of state of consciousness. Now, there are two other metrics that you're going to be seeing discussed uh, during this session. One of them is functional connectivity. Brains with diminished levels of consciousness begin to, to break apart functionally. Um, and another one is the ability to calculate information or information integration capability. The problem is that these latter two require two or more leads uh, in order to be able to assess it. So they are higher density metrics. They require a little bit more information for their calculation. And the question that we're asking today is, are there any nonlinear measures that can track consciousness state changes from a very sparse set of EEG leads? specifically one. Uh, and the answer to this is that there, there, there is a way. There are certain metrics that characterize complexity um, and ways of computing complexity that can be a surrogate uh, for information processing capacity. And you can capture this dynamical property from just a single lead. So let me show you an illustrative example. And you, later in the session, uh, Dr. McIver will go through a bit of history on this particular technique. But let's just say that there are times that frequency-based measures do not completely capture level of consciousness or the consciousness state. So this is an example um, from data that was obtained from a rat. And what you see on the top EEG trace is the rat in slow wave sleep. And underneath it is a rat anesthetized with isoflurane. And you can see that there is a predominance of this sort of slow wave oscillation, this delta oscillation in both. So if you just looked at spectral frequency content, sleeping and being anesthetized don't look too different. 
But if you calculate the equivalent of a chaotic attractor, and that is now a nonlinear dynamical analysis from both of these states, you'll see that slow wave sleep represents a, an attractor that in three dimensions is more spheroidal. It's actually thicker. It looks more like a cigar or like a Polish sausage if you rotate it. And under anesthesia, it becomes thinner and thinner, this attractor, almost more like a, say, a pencil. Now, we look to do something very similar in our patients. So let me set up the experiment. Uh, so we did a retrospective analysis of patients who had been in the operating room who um, were wearing these frontal leads that I had shown you in that previous slide. And what we did was um, we started a propofol infusion uh, at the beginning of the case. And I used an infusion rather than a simple bolus because I actually wanted to be able to track the dynamics in real time of the patient losing responsivity. Now at the point that the patient lost responsiveness, which you see marked here by this black vertical line, um, we continued to measure out. In fact, I measured for the entire case, but we compared a data from two minutes before to two minutes after that loss of consciousness. And you can see that captured here in sort of a representative of four patients from our population. On the left side of the slide, you see loss of responsiveness uh, at that vertical black line. And you will see that appearance actually of that dark red alpha oscillation in each of these cases. On the right hand side is those same four patients after the anesthetic is washed out of their brain reemerging and the vertical black line uh, reflects recovery of response or recovery of consciousness. And you'll see again that sort of alpha oscillation sort of dissolving and there being a more even frequency distribution in all of those higher um, frequencies. I'm gonna bring you back to this because this particular patient is one that I actually constructed the next power spectral density plots from and it becomes really clear what's happening. So these are power spectra for the waking and the unconscious state from that previous patient. And unlike a spectrogram, which has power on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, in this case, we have power on the y-axis and frequency on the x-axis. And essentially what you do is you chunk up your EEG data into time windows. In this case, we use 20 second time windows. And then we characterize what the frequencies look like in their relative proportion. And what you can see is when a patient is awake, there is a preponderance of frequencies in these sort of low frequency domains, um, but you actually get a significant percentage of power in these upper frequencies, in the beta and gamma frequencies. Once the patient becomes unconscious due to propofol, that external perturbation, something interesting happens to the spectrum. Uh, essentially, you now see an increase in relative power for all these slow frequencies. And you see this peak forming in this eight to 12 Hertz range. That's that alpha band that I have been showing you in red. You also see a marked drop off in the higher frequencies beyond the beta range. Now in our study, you can see this from that same representative group of patients from our population, essentially pre loss of consciousness, they have a more even distribution of power in all these frequency bands and post loss of consciousness, they develop this very prominent alpha oscillation and a loss in the higher frequency domain. By the way, in a previous paper, we actually define these spectral states um, for anesthesia much as sleep has been defined in the past. And just like there is something called slow wave sleep, we gave this the name slow wave anesthesia. So moving this into the nonlinear domain. So here's that same experiment. You have a patient we mark the time of loss of response. And then what we did is we took 20 second artifact free clips in the EEG prior to loss and just after loss of consciousness. And then we plotted this thing that looks like a chaotic attractor. These are actually three dimensional time delayed embeddings. And the way they are constructed is you move through that EEG signal, which is remember it's a time series. It is microvolts over time. And you will look at the very first time point, and then you'll go four milliseconds ahead and you'll capture that and four milliseconds ahead. And you will plot that in a three dimensional space. Then you'll shift and you'll do it again. And what you end up doing is drawing an attractor cloud in a three dimensional space from a one dimensional signal. 
And what you can do now is to look at the shape of that attractor cloud because it reflects something about the complexity of that underlying signal. Now, the way to compare this pre and post is to actually fit some metrics to it. So we fitted an ellipsoid solid of revolution to these attractor shapes. And then we calculated the semi-minor and the semi-major axes of these ellipses, and we divided them. And you can imagine that for an ellipse where the semi-minor and semi-major axis are very close in shape, they would be pretty high, those values. They'd be close to one, and you would have a much more spheroidal shape. And if, they, um, if the ERR ratio, the basically ellipse uh, radius ratio, was much, much smaller than one, you would have something that was thinner or much more cigar shaped. And that's, that's what we did. We calculated 3D attractors for both loss and recovery of consciousness. This is sort of a population-based um, example for the patients that I have been showing you spectrograms for. And you can see on the left, this is losing consciousness. All the red attractors are prior to loss of consciousness. All the blue attractors are after the patient lost consciousness. Then we wash the drugs out and you can see, again, those attractors are fairly thin. And as they regain conscious awareness, the attractors become much more spheroidal again. And we, we actually track that for the entire population. And you can see that it was actually significant for both loss of, of, of uh, responsiveness and recovery. So in other words, we could use this particular attractor um, characteristic or metric to track brain dynamics. And if you were wondering if they were statistically significant, they are for both states. So both loss and recovery can be captured by this three-dimensional ellipse. Now, another thing we did was we tested different embedding delays. And the reason for this is that the ideal delay is actually an empirical process. So we varied the delay between four milliseconds all the way out to 2,500 milliseconds or two and a half seconds. And it turns out that only delays of four, eight, and 12 milliseconds are statistically significant. What does that mean? Well, if you actually look at the attractor shapes beyond 12 milliseconds, they look almost entirely spher spheroidal. So there's nothing about these three-dimensional shapes in this sort of, uh, this point space that can actually discriminate states of consciousness. In fact, the most reliable discriminator was at the four millisecond embedding delay. So in order to watch these attractor shapes evolve over time, we plotted the attractors all the way out at time points two minutes before to two minutes after loss of consciousness. And you see that here for patient F, and you can see how the patient has moved from this sort of red spheroidal shape or attractor shape off to the left. Um, to this sort of very, very thin pencil-like shape in blue uh, and out to two minutes post loss of responsiveness. So we've tracked that on the plot on the bottom where it says 3D ERR. That's a, that ellipse uh, uh, radius ratio. But we did two other things. So we used a different complexity measure as well. We calculated something called correlation dimension to, to capture these changes. Now, <clears throat> correlation dimension is another way of looking at complexity or information content. It essentially is another way of calculating fractal dimension or how self-similar a signal is. And the 3D correlation dimension and the 5D correlation uh, dimension also tracked this uh, change in complexity over time. Now, we did the reverse, obviously, for recovery of consciousness. You can see that the patient is moving from being sort of this very, very skinny ellipsoid shape, this flattened ellipsoid shape, back to a spherical shape in red as the patient regained consciousness. Interestingly, as you go past one and a half minutes, it becomes thin again. And this actually reflected something in the behavior of this patient. This patient became, became sleepy and unresponsive again. And this has a lot of real world implications because often patients who technically have had an anesthetic wash out of their brain, they have depots or reserves of this in fatty tissue and they continue to release anesthetics. So if you don't keep the patient stimulated or monitored, the patient may fall back into an over sedated state. And once again, all three of these metrics, the 3D ERR, the 3D complexity dimension and the 5D complexity dimension captured this sort of change in brain dynamics. And here you see a summary for our population. Of the three, the ellipse was actually um, the most statistically significant, followed by the 3D correlation dimension. So to summarize, 
We've shown you in this, um, in this study that brain activity does exhibit nonlinear behavior and at several scales uh, and dimensions in transitions of consciousness. We also tested the use of complexity analysis from nonlinear dynamics to identify loss and recovery of consciousness. We found that time delayed embeddings created these three dimensional attractor shapes that would move from a spherical or awake place to these flattened ellipsoid like shapes which reflected unconsciousness, capturing state transitions from just a single EEG lead. And we also calculate something called correlation dimension to describe attractors to provide a measure of the fractal dimension and complexity of the information content of EEG signals. And similar to these ellipsoids, this also, this measure of complexity also captured and tracked this change in brain dynamics. So we conclude that complexity measures can provide a means for reliably capturing depth of consciousness based on EEG. And in fact, that may prove to be drug invariant, which brings clinical utility to both the operating room and to the intensive care unit. So I would like to thank my collaborators and also our sources of funding. And um, I will stay around for any questions afterwards. And for anyone who wants to get in touch with me, um, I'd appreciate hearing from you. Thank you. Greetings. My name is Matt Banks. I'm a professor of anesthesiology and neuroscience at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I want to thank the organizers of this meeting and in particular Bruce MacGyver for inviting me to participate in this symposium. Today, I want to talk about changes in cortical functional connectivity that are associated with transitions between arousal states during sleep and anesthesia. The results I'm going to share with you today came out of a collaboration between my lab and that of Dr. Kirill Norsky at the University of Iowa and were published recently in NeuroImage. The central motivating question for these experiments is, what changes in the brain when we lose and regain consciousness? A question we address in a variety of experimental settings. Today, I wanna to focus on a comparison between natural sleep and propofol anesthesia. There are a variety of dimensions over which we can compare sleep and anesthesia, and I've listed a few of them here. For some, such as whether or not the subject is arousable and whether there is an underlying architecture to the experience, sleep and anesthesia clearly differ. In others, there is considerable overlap. For example, the involvement of subcortical sleep and arousal centers in the brain. The differential sensitivity of primary versus higher order cortex and for some anesthetic agents, changes in delta power in the cortical electrophysiological signal. Interestingly, when it comes to measures of connectivity in the brain, there are divergent results. Some studies show decreases in connectivity, either global connectivity or more specific pathways, such as corticocortical feedback pathways. Other studies show the opposite result. Some reasons for the divergent results may be that different connectivity metrics were used in different studies, and importantly, the same subjects were not studied in the two conditions. So we wanted to investigate changes in functional connectivity in the same subjects during natural sleep and anesthesia. To do that, we obtained intracranial electrophysiological recordings from neurosurgical patients at the University of Iowa who are having electrodes implanted on and in their brains as part of their treatment for intractable epilepsy. These subjects have two surgeries separated by about two weeks. In the first surgery, they have a couple hundred electrodes implanted over wide areas of the brain, including extensive coverage in temporal lobe and frontal lobe. These electrodes are used to determine the patient's seizure foci and to map particularly critical areas of the brain in preparation for the second surgery. In that surgery, the electrodes are removed and the seizure focus is resected to alleviate their epilepsy. Between the two surgeries, we recruit these subjects to participate in a variety of research studies, including those I'm presented here. Because most epilepsies involve the temporal lobe, which is also the location of auditory cortex, many of our research studies are focused on the auditory cortical hierarchy, and that is how I've color-coded the electrodes in these images. The data set for this study was obtained from five subjects with roughly comparable coverage, extending from primary auditory cortex on Heschel's gyrus 
to secondary and tertiary auditory areas in temporal and parietal cortex, to higher order language processing areas in prefrontal cortex, as well as a variety of other regions. To investigate changes in functional connectivity during transitions between arousal states, we recorded resting state data from each subject during overnight sleep and during anesthesia. The paradigm for one subject is illustrated here. The sleep experiment is illustrated on the left, showing time on the horizontal axis, and the ratio of delta to beta power in one electrode, as well as the EMG signal on the vertical axis. Using standard sleep scoring methods, we labeled each 30-second segment of sleep data according to its associated sleep stage, wake, and one, and two, and three, and REM, color-coded here below the EMG signal. Because only three of the five subjects showed appreciable periods of N3, we'll focus our analysis mostly on N1, N2, and REM. The anesthesia experiment is illustrated on the right. It was performed in the OR just prior to the second surgery, as the subjects were gradually anesthetized with increasing doses of propofol. Here, we're plotting two measures of arousal on the vertical axis, the bispectral index, an EEG-derived measure, and a standard assessment of awareness in the OR, the observer's assessment of arousal and sedation, the OAAS. We used the OAAS to determine whether subjects were sedated or unresponsive under anesthesia. Our hypothesis was that states N2 and N3, when we recorded it, during sleep, during which dreaming is relatively low in frequency, and the state unresponsive under anesthesia, represent states of reduced levels of consciousness, whereas wake and N1 and REM during the sleep experiment, when dreaming is relatively frequent, and the sedated state during the anesthesia experiment would be states of relatively high levels of consciousness. The metric of functional connectivity we chose is the weighted phase-like index, or WPLI, which is a measure of phase synchronization between two signals. It's calculated in the frequency domain, so we need to specify which frequency band we're interested in. Here, we're mostly concerned with the alpha band. It's symmetric and computed pairwise, so it includes both direct and indirect connectivity. It's designed to ignore zero phase lag differences, that is, simultaneous signals, as these likely reflect volume conduction. Importantly, it is unaffected by changes in power that occur in specific bands during arousal transitions during sleep and anesthesia. When we calculate the alpha WPLI for a specific chunk of data, we get an electrode by electrode connectivity or adjacency matrix, as shown here on the left. Here, the electrodes are sorted roughly hierarchically with primary auditory cortex, HGPM, at the top left and progressing to higher order auditory and prefrontal areas, sensory motor areas, and areas not directly related to auditory processing. Note the color scheme here is the same as was shown in the electrode coverage slide. To facilitate computation and account for differences in the number of electrodes in each cortical area in each subject, we reduce the dimensionality of the matrix by computing connectivity on an ROI by ROI basis. That's shown here in the center for the same data. Finally, an alternative representation of these ROI-based data is the cord connectivity plot on the right, where each ROI is a node on the circle, color-coded as above, and the strength of the connection is indicated by the thickness of the lines. For display purposes, these connectivity plots have been thresholded to show only the strongest 10% of the connections. This threshold was not applied for any of the quantitative analyses I'll be presenting. As I mentioned earlier, each time slice of data recorded during sleep and anesthesia has assigned to it a label corresponding to the simultaneously determined arousal state. Here, I'm showing adjacency matrices computed during an overnight sleep experiment some associated with wake, some N1, N2, etc. We can summarize connectivity for each arousal state by averaging over these time slices. 
Other frequency bands did not exhibit this pattern, for example, delta and gamma shown here. So this summary plot supports our hypothesis that cortical connectivity changes upon transitions into states of reduced levels of consciousness, depicted here by transition across a boundary indicated by the vertical dashed line. However, this figure, as striking as it is, is pretty abstracted from the original data. It's averaged over time and over subjects. It's also only showing the 10% strongest connections. We'd like to show quantitatively that this transition boundary exists. That is, that the connectivity profiles overall are more similar between N2 and N1 than between wake and N1, or between unresponsive and sedated compared to sedated and wake in the anesthesia experiment. To do this, we employed two complementary analyses. First, we used a permutation analysis to determine the significance of changes we observed with the core connectivity plots. Using the data for each time slice, we can compute the pairwise differences between adjacency matrices with different labels as a measure of how different connectivity is in one arousal state versus another. We do that by computing the norm of the difference matrix. I'm illustrating the difference between wake sleep and N1, quantified as the average norm of the pairwise differences between all wake sleep and N1 segments. We can then scramble the labels and compute null distributions to test significance. When we do that, we find that the difference between wake sleep and N1 is significantly smaller than the difference between N1 and N2, shown in the top row. And the same is true for wake anesthesia versus sedated and sedated versus unresponsive in the bottom row indicating that there is indeed a transition in the connectivity profile upon crossing this boundary between arousal states of greater versus reduced consciousness. The second analysis we did, we applied was a classifier analysis, again, based on the adjacency matrices calculated for each time slice with its associated label. For each subject, we selected a subset of the wake sleep and N2 time slices and trained a linear classifier to distinguish between the adjacency matrices for these two states, using a logistic regression output to yield a value of one for most wake sleep-like and zero for most N2-like. We then submitted the rest of the data, including the rest of the wake sleep and N2 data, to see how the classifier distinguished the various sleep stages. In general, the classifier performance supported our hypothesis. It easily classified the rest of the wake sleep and N2 data, indicating that we were not overfitting the model, and it classified N3 as being decidedly N2-like, and N1 and REM as being more wake sleep-like. Furthermore, it easily classified the wake anesthesia and unresponsive data as being wake sleep-like and N2-like respectively, indicating that there is an intrinsic similarity between alpha band WPLI connectivity profiles during sleep and anesthesia. For the sedated state, the result was more wake sleep-like than not, but it clearly represented a transitional state, perhaps indicating fluctuating levels of arousal during propofol sedation. We also noted that the dominant connectivity shifted from the posterior to anterior parts of the brain during reduced levels of consciousness associated with sleep and anesthesia. That is from temporal and parietal to frontal. This is reminiscent of the argument put forth a few years back by Melanie Boli and colleagues about the location of the neural correlates of consciousness. Here, content-specific Neurocorrelates of Consciousness, or NCC, indicated in red, 
are defined as those areas directly contributing to phenomenal distinctions, for example, low level visual features, faces, or places within consciousness. The full NCC, outlined in orange, is constituted by the union of all the content specific NCCs. The transition boundary that we observe is strikingly similar to the boundary between the full NCC and areas outside the full NCC. We quantified this shift by computing a measure of regional bias and connectivity, defined as the difference in mean connectivity between all ROIs in the back of the brain and the mean connectivity between all ROIs in the front of the brain. There was a clear shift in this regional bias with transitions into states of reduced consciousness with dominant connectivity shifting from Bowley's full NCC to frontal areas in states of reduced levels of consciousness. In summary then, functional connectivity as measured by alpha band WPLI indexes arousal state. There is a similarity between cortical network organization during propofol anesthesia and sleep and states of reduced consciousness, N2, N3, and unresponsive under anesthesia, are characterized by reduced posterior and enhanced anterior connectivity. Finally, I want to thank a remarkable collection of colleagues and support staff who help with this project, as well as NIH and my department for funding. Thank you for your attention. Hi, my name is Hon Su Lee. I'm a postdoctoral researcher from University of Michigan. Today, I'm going to talk about spiking pattern of individual neurons under conscious and anesthetized conditions. Before talking about spike activity under anesthesia, let's talk about brain state first. We believed that anesthesia induces specific neural activity pattern of brain state which changes as a function of anesthetic concentration. For example, at very low dose anesthetic, uh, we would see paradoxical excitation. In deeper anesthesia, we would see slower and high amplitude EEG or LP. Uh, at very high dose anesthesia, we would see birth suppression pattern. Likewise, most studies assume that brain state as a one-to-one -one correspondence with anesthetic concentration, and therefore they performed concentration-dependent approach. However, recent studies found different brain states in a fixed anesthetic concentration, and furthermore, they observed one brain state in different concentrations. Here, at fixed isoforane concentration, the power spectrum can spontaneously fluctuate. Here in another study, the authors identified nine distinct brain states based on EEG functional connectivity. And you can see that over this long time period, there are many transitions between different brain states. These findings suggest the local brain states spanning 100 micrometer defined by spiking activities of neuronal population may also have a many-to-many -many correspondence with anesthetic concentration. Therefore, we identify local brain states under anesthesia and examine state-dependent changes of spiking patterns of individual neurons. This study will allow us to better understand neuronal basis of anesthetic-induced states of unconsciousness and also Many neuroscientific data is obtained uh, under anesthetized condition. Therefore, this will also help interpret the neuroscientific data. So this is the experiment we performed. First, we implant multi-electrode array here on right primary visual cortex and record spike activity. We also gave light flash here as a visual stimulation. And this is the experimental protocol we used anesthetic aspirin and decreased its concentration in a stepwise manner. Here, the gray color represents recording time, and cyan and magenta represent spontaneous and stimulation session, respectively. Today, due to limited time, I'm going to focus on spontaneous activity data only.
from this recording, we could identify spiking activity of individual neurons. And based on their spike waveform, we classify them into white spiking, the red color, and narrow spiking, the blue color. The white spiking neurons correspond to putative excitatory neurons, and narrow spiking neurons are expected to be putative inhibitory neurons. The first goal of this study is to identify brain states based on spiking activity of neurons independent of anesthetic concentration. Therefore, we chose measures that can be applied to spike trains to quantify the well-known effects of anesthesia. The well-known effects are reduced spiking activity, temporal fragmentation of spikes, reduced neural complexity, or suppression pattern in high-dose anesthesia. These were quantified these spike measures, total number of spikes, mean spike rate, mean local variation, sample entropy, longest period below mean. I'm not going to explain the details of these measures now, but feel free to ask a question later. Here, the time course of the five spike measures were visualized along with RFP spectrogram. You can see that the spike measures spontaneously changed even during the fixed anesthetic concentration. For example, at 6%, uh, many measures changed abruptly. The spike measures were fed as an input to the clustering algorithm. The method divided the data set into five brain states, S1 to S5. The five states are here denoted by different colors. So let's look at the occurrence of the brain states in the data. This pie chart represents the relative frequency of the brain states in each anesthetic concentration. In general, S1 and S3 were mostly seen at 6%, S2 at 4%, S4 at 2%, S5 at 0%. Obviously, S5 represents wakefulness state. The important thing here is that the brain state and anesthetic concentration did not have one-to-one -one relationship. For instance, S1 was seen during 4% as well as at 6%. These are the representative LFP traits. LFP in S1 displayed birth suppression pattern. S2 and S4 revealed relatively high amplitude, slow activity as generally expected in anesthesia. In contrast, although S3 was mostly seen in 6% as brain, this show relatively low amplitude and desynchronized RFP pattern, distinct from S1. The RFP pattern in S3 raised the question whether the arousal level may also be elaborated in S3 as it is in S5. Therefore, we measured EMG activity to follow the level of arousal. Although both S1 and S3 occurred mostly in 6% as brain, EMG of S3 was substantially higher than that of S1 or S2. Here is the uh, statistical comparison. The seven lines represent seven animals. Statistically significant differences in the rescaled EMG were found for S3 versus S1 and S3 versus S5. Now we compare the five brain states in terms of both the number of emitted spikes and the average spike rate of individual neurons. The trace of mean SR spike rate and TNS total number of spikes deviated from each other, especially at 6% desperate. The TNS showed a pronounced decrease when the brain state transitioned from S3 to S1, whereas the mean spike rate remained the same. The, in S3, many neurons were inactive, even more than S1 and S2, but there were a few neurons with very high SR. Accordingly, the variation of SR across individual neurons was, was the highest in S3. The Gini coefficient of S3 was significantly larger than all the other four brain states. Next, we investigate the temporal dynamics of spike activity. Here the black dots are rest plot, vertical axis is for neuron index. As you can see here, spikes in S1, S2, and S4 were synchronously fragmented. On the other hand, S3 and S5 have asynchronous firing pattern. 
The figure below is about interspike intervals, ISI, of seven representative neurons. The red color is for wide spiking neurons, and blue is for narrow spiking neurons. Notice that the vertical axis here represent ISI value, not the neuron index. The shape of ISI distribution was profoundly altered by the anesthetic. In wakefulness, the ISI distribution was unimodal, whereas in the other four brain states, it was bimodal or multimodal. This was partially due to the silent period in the spike activity. The large ISI value near 1000 millisecond correspond to silent period that contribute to an upper peak in ISI histogram. In addition, some white spiking neurons in S1 and S2 showed burst activity that was associated with very short ISI near at 10 milliseconds. In this slide, we focused more on the bursting activity of white spiking neurons. This is an autocorrelogram of white spiking neurons as brain state changed from S5 to S1, the occurrence of a short ISI was dramatically increased. In this analysis, we excluded the inactive or silent neurons with spike rate less than 1 Hz. Here, I compare the burst activity of two extreme cases, S1 versus S5. Each dot here represents a single neuron. Here, the burst ratio is defined as a ratio of the number of burst activity, that is the number of spikes whose ISI is less than 10 milliseconds, to the total number of spikes. In S1, there are many inactive neurons, that is neurons with spike rate less than 1 Hz, and the remaining active neurons have a high burst ratio. In S5, many uh, inactive neurons became active, and burst ratio was decreased. Next, we examined a relationship between individual neurons and population activity. We calculated cross-correlation between spikes of a single neuron and spikes of a population. A substantial change in correlation was observed in both white spiking and narrow spiking neurons. All pairwise comparisons were statistically significant for white spiking neurons. High neuron to population coupling in anesthesia suggests an increase of shared information. However, because the entire population acts like a single neuron, the information content in the neural network should be extremely limited. This may explain why we are not conscious during slow oscillations. Now we measure transfer entropy, a measure of information transfer between individual neurons. Because spike itself is in part a result of a neuronal interaction, TE is expected to be positively correlated with spike rate. Here, x-axis is spike rate of a receiving unit or neuron, and the y-axis is spike rate of sending neurons. And the dots represent individual neuron pairs. And the color of each dot represents the TE value, blue being low and red being high TE value. Because the spike rate is high in S5, there are many dots in the upper right areas of this uh, panel. Because of this, the sum of TE, TES, is highest in S5 compared to other four brain states. Neurons with SR uh, spike rate less than 1 Hz were excluded from this figure. In contrast, we found an opposite result with the mean TE, TEM. The mean TE was lowest in S5. This is because for equally active neurons, TE is higher in anesthesia than in wakefulness. Um, let's look at the black square here. For example, the dots in black square here have more reddish color than the dots in here. Finally, we examined the distribution of TE. We calculated the Gini coefficient to quantify TE transfer entropy disparity. Gini coefficient of S5 was lower than all the other four states, suggesting that the dispersion of transfer entropy is lowest in S5. This and the result of the previous slide can be explained by the information diagram. Here in each circle represents 
the amount of information. This is the information of xt plus 1, xt, and this is for yt. The yellow area here represents the shared information between xt plus 1 and yt given xt. This is the uh, definition of transfer entropy. As I explained before, anesthesia reduces SR, spike rate, and many neurons become inactive or silent. For the inactive neurons, the shared information is negligible. For active neurons, on the other hand, because they have bursting spike pattern and are synchronous with each other, the transfer entropy is also high. This explains why the total TE is low in anesthesia, while the mean TE and disparity are relatively higher than wakefulness state. So these are conclusions. The local cortical stage identified by spiking pattern displayed degeneracy in their relationship with the anesthetic concentration. This is consistent with the previous EEG studies. A previous unidentified paradoxical state, the S3, was found in high-dose anesthesia. The asynchronous firing pattern and high muscle activity suggest a possibility of transient awareness in this state. In general, under death for rain anesthesia, some neurons became silent while others became bursty and synchronous with each other. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to talk to you today about uh, another way to produce loss of consciousness, uh, so-called G-force-induced loss of consciousness, or G-lock. Now, this is a collaboration between my lab and the uh, Armstrong Laboratory at Brooks Air Force Base. So who cares about uh, G-lock? Well, the Air Force, uh, NASA, Navy pilots, and uh, the Department of Defense in general, because uh, uh, this occurs in pilots, um, often during training for uh, fighter pilots and astronauts, etc. So it ends up costing uh, the death of pilots and loss of millions of dollars um, for every incident that occurs. We know it results from high acceleration, which uh, depletes the brain of blood flow because it's all being pushed back down to the heart. And it happens when uh, evasive maneuvers, dives, and climbs are, um, are performed in these uh, uh, fighter jets. So it first became a problem when uh, these fast and maneuverable uh, jets were deployed, like the F-16. It's only gotten worse with the newer generation F-22s and the newest F-35 planes that are uh, more maneuverable and faster and can expose pilots to uh, much higher uh, g-forces. So to prevent g-lock and subsequent uh, crashes of uh, planes, we'd like a way to detect um, the onset of loss of consciousness. And uh, we asked a simple question, can we use an EEG measure to detect G-lock in pilots? Now, the way you produce uh, G-lock in pilots and astronauts is you put a fighter plane module or a astronaut capsule on the end of this big centrifuge, and you spin them around at uh, high speeds, uh, many RPMs. And that produces uh, the force from the head to the toes, um, resulting in the ischemia at the, at the brain level. Turns out that astronauts and fighter pilots are, uh, are very expensive to use as research subjects. And given our budget, uh, we were forced to scale things down to a centrifuge that fit a rat uh, and then we implanted electrodes in the rat's uh, skull so we could get a high fidelity EEG signal from um, each subject. Now what happens as you uh, accelerate uh, rats is they start off with a typical high frequency, low amplitude awake EEG pattern. 
So it doesn't really change much until you get to a, a threshold, in this case of about 15 Gs. Then you start to see um, an increase in amplitude, and especially these slow waves. And uh, this can uh, uh, switch to a burst suppression pattern and then isoelectric EEG shown here. And we can look at this in higher resolution. So to begin with, the uh, normal EEG uh, pattern is seen. Early on in acceleration, we see an increase in theta uh, rhythms um, followed subsequently by a slowing into the delta frequency range with a in further increase in amplitude. And then we see isoelectric where all that's left are the uh, heartbeats here. And uh, on recovery, we see um, you know burst of activity, high frequencies, and these uh, burst suppression patterns, which we can also see um, in the uh, onset of acceleration too. Now here's a little burst just before we go into isoelectric activity. So if we look at the spectral content following acceleration, so here's time on this axis and uh, EEG power on the y-axis as a percent of control, you can see that on acceleration we get an increase in delta slow wave activity in theta activity, and in alpha activity. Now this is quite different from what you see with an anesthetic-induced loss of consciousness where you see an increase in delta frequency activity, but a decrease in all these other frequency bands at the point of loss of consciousness. So this uh, EEG pattern is unique. Only ischemia produces uh, this simultaneous increase in all three frequency bands. So we could use this now to uh, uh, monitor pilot consciousness and provide uh, feedback to the autopilot systems in the jets to prevent uh, G-lock crashes. Turns out this worked very well with the deployment of the F-22s uh, there were virtually no G-lock induced plane crashes in the training programs where we would normally expect uh, up to eight pilots a year could die. And uh, this, of course, will be even more important in the uh, more maneuverable F-35 planes that are just being deployed now. So giving you an example today of how we can use EEG processing to save millions of dollars and lives uh, each year um, just uh, by careful monitoring of EEG. We hope, like uh, Divya showed you earlier, that we'll be able to save uh, money and lives in operating rooms by monitoring the EEG signals during anesthesia to prevent too deep or not deep enough anesthetics. Well, thank you, and I'd be happy to um, answer any questions uh, you have about um, this talk or anything else I've talked about today.